Today's scripture reading is uh, comes from Mark chapter three, verse seven through twelve. That is chapter uh, Mark chapter three, seven through twelve. Jesus with, uh, drew with his disciples from the sea of Gal, from the sea, and a great crowd followed. Followed from Ju- Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the Dumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest uh, they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God, and he strictly ordered them not to make him known. certainly good to be together to worship God to those who are visiting with us we want you to know that you are welcome and wanted here at the Brighton Church of Christ if you're in this area and you're looking for a church home you're looking for a deeper relationship with God we invite you to ask questions of the elders or the ministers or any of the members here we will seek to get you the best and and most sound biblical answer possible we want to make sure that uh, you are right with God as each one of us seeking that same thing for our own selves, that we are right with the Heavenly Father. If you've not done so, we would invite you to fill out a visitor's card from the back of the pew in front of you, uh, and if you would just hand it to one of the members here, they'll make sure that it gets to the right place. If I today offered you one million dollars, or I'll give you a penny, but tomorrow I'll double that penny, In fact, I will double that for the next 30 days. Which would you take? I remember when Mr. Huggins, my sixth grade math teacher and uh, the principal of the elementary school at the same time, asked our class that same question. Most everyone in the class was like, oh, I'm taking the million dollars. I don't want no penny. I want the million dollars. But I knew there had to be a catch. And so I went and figured out that you would actually gain more at the end of 30 days than if you took the million dollars up front. But you know, there's a lot of people that live their lives for the instant gratification, for the million dollars now, instead of the great sum that they could have if they would wait, if they would look further down the road than five minutes. That's how a lot of people treat Jesus as well. Even in the first century, they came to Jesus looking five minutes down the road. My aches, my pains, my disease will be taken away with no thought of eternity. What's going to happen ultimately in the end of all things? As we turn to Mark chapter 3 and and verse 7, uh, this really begins what we we would say the second major section in in the the gospel of Mark. Uh, You have the introduction which kind of sets the stage with John and Jesus. And then you have this summary statement in chapter 1 verses about verses 12 through 15, but especially 14 and 15, that tells us what Jesus was about. He was about preaching the gospel. And then you have these two uh, ideas, the the growing of the fame in chapter 1 and the conflicts that arose with it in chapter 2 and the first paragraph of chapter 3. But here in verse 7, we have what we call another summary statement. This is a a literary device that Mark does uh, different from Matthew or Luke, even though they are synoptic or they are seeing much the same story. This is one place where Mark differs from Matthew and Luke. He gives this this summary statement that begins really an entire new section of, of his gospel. And it's almost there to tell us, look, uh, uh, what has proceeded is connected, but is not necessarily in order from these things. Mark is not uh, uh, collecting these, this account for a chronological detail of Jesus Christ. Rather, what Mark is doing is he's gathering the important information that we need to remember about Jesus, such things as the conflicts that he withstood in chapter 1. And such things as his, his teaching ministry that we see really exemplified in the second section. 
And, and he's, he's gathering those stories which most uh, illustrate his point or his purpose in each one of these sections. And so this summary statement speaks in general of, of Jesus' ministry, just like we, see, we saw of Jesus' ministry in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. There, it was a summary statement about the preaching of the kingdom of God. Here, it's a summary statement about his ministry and his miracles and the exorcisms which he performed. In both summaries, Jesus is separated. In chapter 1, he is separated in the wilderness where he is tempted. Matthew gives us a very uh, uh, detailed account of that temptation of for 40 days or, or the temptation after 40 days of fasting. Mark just tells us that he goes into the wilderness and that he is tempted. And so we see that in Mark. But here we see him withdrawing to the sea. This withdrawal to the sea is kind of like a, a return to the wilderness, a return to the, the, uh, the temptations and the strength which he's going to find there. But what's interesting is that like the wilderness that, that confirmed or affirmed his messiahship and his sonship, we see that again here in this summary statement as well when we see the, the demons actually declaring that you are the son of God. These summaries themselves in chapter 1 and chapter 3 are also followed by a call. In chapter 1, it is the call of the first disciples. Here in chapter 3, the very next paragraph is going to be the, the separating of the 12 for their, their office as apostles. And so we see that parallel as well. We see in the summary statements being used as that jumping off part of, of, the, of each section, this literary device that separates it from the rest not necessarily connecting. And what it does, to me anyway, is it, it kind of says, okay, that's, that's the point. I want you to get the fame and the conflict of Jesus. Now I want you to look forward to what's coming in the rest of the story. And so it's, it, it kind of helps focus our attentions uh, to the point of the next section. In this section, Mark is going to further uh, what we refer to as the messianic secret. This we, we've talked about from the very beginning. Mark tells us in, the, in chapter 1, verse 1, that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He reveals that to us, the readers. But as the story unfolds before us, what we see is that no one is really getting it. We see a few people that are getting it here and there, but the disciples, the ones who are with him 24-7, it seems, they don't get it. They don't get it till the very end. The religious leaders, those who've spent most of their time in the scriptures of the Old Testament, which should have recognized the coming of Jesus, they don't get it. The only ones that really seem to get it are the demons, but they're of supernatural origin, it seems, and so, of course, they're going to get it. The harlots and the publicans and the sinners, they seem to get it because they are desperate to be removed from the sin, the unknown, they seem to get it more than anybody else. But Mark is really holding the full reveal until chapter 15, holding it close to his chest. We, we refer to this in, in theological circles as the messianic secret. Matthew doesn't carry that. John doesn't carry that. Luke doesn't carry that. Mark alone does that. He's, he tells this story. And remember, this is the first of the written accounts that went out in the first century after the, the life of Christ or about the life of Christ. This is the story Mark wants to tell. And so he tells us that, that messianic secret. The other one is, is there's, there's a, the touch imagery is used again in this one. In fact, Mark, Mark refers to touched or touching of Jesus uh, more than any of the other gospels. We saw it first uh, back in, in chapter 1 with the uh, uh, leper who came to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. And he reached out in Mark 1 and verse 41 and touched him and said, I will be clean. Remember, he didn't have to touch him, but there is something about Jesus and the touch of the Savior. In fact, I, I, I called that sermon when we did that uh, several weeks ago, a, touch, a Savior's Touch. Um, and our title today is A Savior's Touch Revisited. <laughs> because it's still about how Jesus is willing and desirous of touching lives. Out of this literary uh, 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 device, Mark then contrasts 
uh, the, the different receptions of Jesus, how people responded to him. Let's look at our text real quick. And beginning in verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and Idumea, from beyond the Jordan, from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, uh, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. The first ones we see here in the context, of course, are the disciples themselves. How did the disciples seem to react to Jesus? I find this interesting as we, we look back at chapter 2 and we see all the conflict that happened. They were plucking grain, remember, and, and, and eating it in the field on the Sabbath day. Oh, oh, the, the Pharisees say, you, you can't do that. They, they were very angry with Jesus and with his disciples. But what's interesting is that this withdrawal by Jesus isn't just about getting away from town and out into the countryside to see the beauty and the splendor of the countryside. It's about separating himself further from the Jewish traditions and the conflicts with the priests and the rulers and the scribes and the Pharisees who have really corrupted God's religion. They are, it's not just a withdrawing from them, it's a withdrawing from this Jewish corruption. And, and, and so this, uh, this means, of course, a deeper conflict with those who are trying to hold on to those traditions. The fact that the disciples follow him. You know, there are times we see Jesus withdrawing to himself to pray. But here the disciples specifically are mentioned. They too are withdrawing. They are, are causing a... a, a uh, they're also pulling away from those traditions and those corruptions. The fact that they're following him to the sea indicates a, a, even a further separation from their old way of life. Look, this is how Peter and, 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 and John and James and Andrew, this is how they grew up under these traditions, under this teaching. This is, this is what they knew. But in order to withdraw further with Jesus, that means they had to separate themselves from that old way of life. And of course, that means not just a deeper conflict, but, but really a deeper devotion to Christ. It's as, it's as if the longer Jesus is on this earth and teaching, the, the, the longer he is here doing what he's supposed to do, uh, the closer they have to draw to Jesus in order to keep their faith safe. There's, there's little room for the limbo. In fact, those oftentimes that got caught in limbo uh, were, were, were harmed greatly. Even Peter at times when he seemed to vacillate um, took a hit on his faith. Then you also have the crowd. The crowd, it says, comes from miles around Chapter 1 and 2, we saw that the fame of Jesus was growing, and as it was growing, it was, it was causing more conflict with the Jewish leadership. But we shouldn't take the conflict with the Jewish leadership to mean that, that all the people then uh, separated themselves from Jesus. No. In fact, uh, if you took the Jewish leadership out of it, most of the Jews had a reason to follow Jesus. They liked what he had to say, but more importantly, uh, they heard what he was doing. That's what the text says. Um, you know, that's the way a lot of things are. They, 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 instead of hearing what he was teaching and be converted by it, they simply heard what he was doing. They saw the outward appearance and they wanted to follow that. They came from the extremes of Israel. You think about uh, what he says, or says, Israel proper, which is Galilee and Judea, and of course Samaria that's sandwiched in between them. But then he, he goes on to say Idumea, which is going to be in the southern extreme, south of Judea. And from the Transjordan area, that on the east side of the Jordan River. And, the, and so that's kind of the eastern boundary. And then he says Tyre and Sidon, which are in the north. And so uh, we're seeing the boundaries of Israel, north, south, east, and west. They're coming from all these extremes. Mark, Mark uses another literary device right here in, in these verses. And it's, it's interesting because he says uh, in, in verse 7 and 8, uh, he says, a, a great crowd followed. Now that phrase, a great crowd, is used again in verse 8. When we study such literary devices like this, we call that a bracket. 
when you say one thing, make a statement and say the, the same thing again. We see it again in the very next paragraph when he calls the 12. And then he calls them for what? And then he calls the 12 again. Uh, it's a bracket. And, and the idea is that it's, it's as if Mark is saying, okay, the great crowd is one side of the bracket, and the great crowd is the other side of the bracket, and whatever is in between, uh, you, you draw circles and arrows, underline, boldface, and highlight, because that's what's important. Get this. And, and we see it, uh, we'll, we'll just skip real quick down to the, the apostles, beginning in verse 13. It says that in verse 14, he appointed 12 from whom he also named apostles so that they might uh, be with him and might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12. See that phrase again. So why, why were they appointed? What was their purpose? Well, look at the sandwich in the middle. You know, some people like the bread. I like the meat in the middle. Notice the meat in the middle. Uh, they are apostles. They would be with him. He would send them out on the limited commissions and ultimately the great commission to preach the gospel. That's why they're here, to preach the gospel and to have authority and to cast out demons. That's who they were. And he wants us to understand these, these, that's what these men are about. Well, the same thing is happening here in this section when he says a great crowd from all these places. There's a great crowd. So what is it about these places that's so significant? Why is Mark saying, highlight these some have said, well, it, it's kind of a road map to the rest of his ministry. We, of course, see that in Mark, the bulk of Jesus' ministry is around Galilee. But we know that he does eventually get to Jerusalem and Judea in chapter 11 and verse 11. We also see that he goes to these other places. For example, uh, he goes beyond the, the Jordan on the Transjordan area in chapter 5 and verse 1. We see that he goes all the way up into Tyre and Sidon in chapter 7, verse 24, when he meets the Syrophoenician woman. And so it's a roadmap to Jesus' ministry. Of course, Idumea is, does not fit in that bill. Uh, we, we don't ever see him in Mark going to Idumea, so maybe, maybe that's not it. To me, I think it's, it's really just a confirmation of, of the, the wide birth of Jesus' fame. Not only does it saturate Israel, but it's starting to creep out of Israel proper, going all the way down into Idumea, which, which ultimately was a land uh, that, that was controlled by Edoms, Edomites, uh, who were Esau's descendants. Uh, it goes all the way out into the Transjordan area, which would be the Moabites and the Ammonites, and, and it goes all the way up into Tyre and Sidon, which is getting into the region of the Phoenicians. In other words, not only does it touch the lives of Jews, but Jesus' message and Jesus' fame is going even into the Gentile areas. And this was amazing. It, it suggests that, that uh, also that the nation was, was, to me, longing for something uh, to bring them out, uh, to, to, to get them out of the, the, the mire and the, the depression. You know, this, this is something we don't often think about, but, but when we are, are wrapped up in sin, when we are separated from God, there, I believe, is an innate sense within us that knows we are contradicting our Creator, that we are out of harmony with the conductor of the universe. And we want to get back into harmony. We're looking for a way to get back there. Now, we may sear that conscience over as with a hot iron. We may learn to ignore that sense of ought that God put in us. I think most people, most people, they, they, they want to get back into harmony. And as Jesus' fame spread, there was that aha moment in many hearts that said, this, this can be the way. Sadly, these people, they weren't really looking for a release from their sin or an empty and vain faith or, or even a corrupted legal system. What they saw Jesus as uh, was a remedy for their bodily discomforts and their aches and pains and their diseases. And they were so enamored with Jesus as a faith healer. Well, te te technically he wasn't a faith healer. He was healing people regardless if they had faith or not. He was a healer. And they were so focused and intent on that that they, they begin to press upon him and push on him. And he says, he tells the disciples, have a boat ready so that I can save myself. It's interesting. He, 
Here's a man of miracles, the power of God, and yet he's not even relying on miracles to save his own life in this instance. He's relying on what man can do. Do what you can do, and God will make up the rest. Have a boat ready. I will get in it to save myself from being crushed from this crowd. And notice what they are wanting. They just want to touch him. It's like the woman of the issue of blood in chapter 5. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I can be healed. They just want to touch the Savior. What they miss is that what they really need is for the Savior to touch them. Not for the healing, but for something even greater. And then finally, here, the reception of the demoniacs, those who were demon-possessed, they are also confronted with Jesus. This was the, the, the power struggle between God and the devil, and that's what this is, represents here. Uh, it, was, it was commonly believed in many ancient cultures that to speak someone's name was to have control over them, was to, to give, give power to them over your life. And so often people would go by a, a given name or a different name in order to keep you from having power over my true identity. There's a lot of games we played as kids, you know, where you stand in front of mirrors and turn off lights and repeat certain names three times or seven times. Why? It's, it, it, that's actually a tradition coming from not 100 or 200 years ago. That's a tradition going back millennia. And many believe that's exactly what the demons are doing here. By, by identifying who Jesus is. We know who you are, you son of God, that they were seeking to have power over Jesus, to be able to control him, to have him submit to their authority. And so it is a power struggle uh, over authority and over who has the greater might between God and the devil. This battle over authority, which will later in this very same chapter is going to be challenged by the religious authorities as well. Who gave you this authority or by what authority? The devil is trying to flex his muscles against God, but in the end, as we would expect, the devils lose, right? The devils lose because, or the demons lose, because Jesus demonstrates complete power. In fact, he tells them in verse 12, he strictly orders them not to make him known. And it appears, it appears that they have to listen to Jesus because his authority is so great. It's interesting as we look at this, we might think, well, why, why doesn't Jesus allow these supernatural beings, these beings that are from another realm, identify who he is in this realm? Seems like that would be advantageous to Jesus. I'm telling you I'm the son of God. The devil himself tells you I'm the son of God. But he doesn't let them say that. Why? I think it goes back to the nature of the devil. Jesus would say in John chapter 8 and verse 44 uh, that you are of your father the devil who is a liar. Right? He's a liar. Well, it's one thing we know about liars is that they lie, Right? And even when a liar tells the truth, there's some skepticism, right? The old story of the boy who cried wolf. There's a wolf in the flock. There's a wolf in the flock. And when there finally was a wolf in the flock, how did the townspeople react? We can't trust you. And the sheep were devoured. Same thing is happening here. Think about this. If the devil, who is a liar, who always speaks lie and every once in a while tells the truth, and he says, this is the son of God. There's going to be confusion. Do we believe the devil now or do we not believe the devil? Jesus doesn't need any more hits against his identity. And so to leave doubt behind and have a surety, he commands the demons, do not make him known. It's quite an interesting story uh, or summary. And, and, and I don't know that there's just, uh, uh, that Mark intends us to understand that there's a, a single incident where Jesus said this to the demons, but rather this was a summary of, of what is happening in, in the later ministry of Jesus. He continues to be fronted, confronted by those who are demons and those who are against him and those who are challenging his authority. And Jesus continues to establish it over and over and over and over again. 
But what about this touch, this idea of touch? In the first section of Mark, the leper implores Jesus to heal him, which Jesus graciously does. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes we think that, that we've got to overcome the reluctance of God. Uh, the, the, the leper even says, you know, uh, if you will, you can make me clean. If you will, if you will uh, uh, put away your hesitation and put away your reluctance. But Jesus doesn't have any reluctance. There is no hesitation. He graciously wants to help this man. But in the process, he touches the leper. Now Mark repeats that idea. But this time, the people want to touch Jesus. They want to catapult him into stardom. Think about those on the red carpet. And the velvet rope that separates the celebrities from the, the regular Joes, right? And how many of them stand there and they're, they're reaching out. If we can just touch the fame, maybe I could be a movie star. If I could touch him, I could be that rich. But they needed to see that being touched by the Savior is greater than than getting to touch the Savior. You see, it's about seeing with His eyes. See, they needed to see past the physical needs to the spiritual needs. Their knees ached. Their back hurt. Cancer had got them. All sorts of diseases of blindness and deafness, lameness, paralysis, epilepsy, all the diseases that were known to mankind and they could see about this far. If my back wouldn't hurt, if I got rid of this leprosy, if this disease was not plaguing me, and they're not even concerned about eternity, you know, the Jews knew something of heaven, of God, of something beyond this life. They knew something was there. The Bible had told them. God had spoke to them. Sometimes it's hard to look down the road when the next five minutes seems unbearable. And so they didn't come to Jesus to meet their spiritual needs. They came because they heard what he was doing. Oh, that they had heard what he was saying and said, I've got to learn more. Oh, that they'd given their hearts over to a faith that was bolstered by the word of God. No, their, their faith only brought them out of their distant homes to be healed. They needed to see past the physical to the spiritual. They needed to see past the miracle to the power that was behind the miracle. They, they, in, in instead of seeing, oh, this man can walk or that woman can see or... or the cancer is gone or the leprosy is gone or whatever. Instead of just seeing the miracle and standing in awe of the miracle and how this person can now live a normal life like the rest of us, they need to see beyond the miracle to, to the power behind it. How did this happen? There is a God in heaven. Jehovah showers his blessings upon us. God wants to be reunited with us who have lost fellowship with him. They could just see beyond. Maybe, maybe the touch of the Savior would allow them to see beyond the miracle to the power behind the miracle. They needed to see past the moment to the eternity. Not just the million dollars today. What's going to happen at the end of 30 days? What's going to happen after 60 days? What's going to happen? the end of our lives. When we step across death, we step on the road of eternity. You see, we are so focused on this body, on this here and now. The word we use is secular. Secular. It, it it comes from Latin. <laughs> my high school students know about my Latin. It comes from the Latin, seculum. 
They used a phrase, the seculum et mundus, which was the here and now. That's what it meant. It's the here and now. The secular are those who are only concerned about the here and now. That's what it means. And we are in a secular culture that is just worried about the here and now. The only future thing people talk about right now are who's going to win the NBA championship. That's, all, that's the only future. It, it, you know, will, will the Rockies get into the playoffs? That's the only future we're really worried about. But we need to look past this moment, past these mundane things, to eternity. They needed to see past the actions to the teaching. Jesus graciously healed people. But what Xavier was talking about this morning, about Jesus emptying himself and taking up on him the form of the servant, that wasn't so he could heal so many people. That was so he could teach. You see, the presence of Jesus is about God putting himself in the world with us. God came down. You remember when the heavens are ripped open in chapter 1? The Spirit comes down. God speaks from heaven. Jesus is here. The entirety of the Godhead is present in the world in that moment. To me, that is an inkling of what ultimately heaven will be. After the redemption, what will be there for us? God, the Son, and the Spirit together with us, not separated from us. It's about God coming down to the world, be in the world with us. It's, it's, it's about God who is spirit trying to awaken our spirits to his presence in our lives. It is about the God of miracles having the greatest power, the power to overcome sin, the power to change my destiny. It's about the eternal God inviting us to the eternal home. Jesus' touch is, is about more than miracles. Brother, Jesus' touch is about more than salvation. Oh, I, I want salvation. I want my sins forgiven. But it's about more than that. Jesus' touch is about reminding us that there is a lasting relationship with God. You see, I don't obey just because I want my sins forgiven. That's, man, God can do that in the blink of an eye. I don't obey just so I can be saved from an eternity in hell. That's easy. I obey God because I want to be with God. That dissonance that I feel when I'm out of harmony with the creator and conductor of the universe, I want to be back in harmony with him. I want to walk in step with him. I want to please him. I want that eternity with him. That's the abundant life that Jesus was talking about. Just as people of Israel failed to see the magnitude of what Jesus was bringing because of their material myopia, only focused on the matter, the here and now, many people today miss it for the same reason. They're too enamored with material things, with physical things, with this earth, that they're so one-sided, they cannot see beyond. It's how Peter himself described it in 2 Peter 1 and verse 9. That they are so nearsighted, they are blind and cannot see far off. They cannot see the eternal destiny. So I figured it out. You could take the $1 million today, or in 30 days you would have over 10 million, almost 11 million dollars. That's, that's, that's a pretty good increase. You see, Jesus is the penny every day, doubled. Not for 30 days, but doubled every day for eternity. There are no words to describe the value of having Jesus, of knowing Jesus. Paul said it is inexpressible. We cannot even find the words. And just as he reached out to the leper so many years ago, brethren, 
He reaches out today. He still reaches out to me. Have you let him touch your life? Have you let him into your world? Have you welcomed a relationship with Jesus? If not, if not, would you make that change today? He still has the power if you have the willingness and the humility to come to him in submission. Obeying the gospel, being baptized for the remission of your sins, God will accept you. Not just accept you, he will embrace you. He will pull you in for all of eternity. But you've got to make those steps today. If you'll respond to his invitation while we stand.